ever get that feel? You know that feeling where it's like, whoa, real life is way stranger than anything you'd see in a movie. Yeah, definitely. That's what we're diving into today. This case, it's 2019 Northern BC. And what starts is, I don't know, just a really sad situation. It becomes this huge thing, a nationwide manhunt had everyone in Canada on edge. I remember that. Everyone was glued to the news. Absolutely. So we're talking Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski got our news articles, even something that looks like a, a Wikipedia page on this whole thing. Once we get into it, you'll see just how wild it got. A lot to unpack. It really is. Okay, so picture this. July, you're driving on the Alaska Highway, beautiful scenery. Sounds peaceful so far. Right. But you come across this van, broken down, Inside are Lucas Fowler and Chinadis, young couple from Australia and the U.S. They were on this big adventure, mm. and that's where it ends for them. Tragic. Now, you might be thinking, okay, awful, but these things happen sometimes. Accidents, right. Yeah. But here's the thing. Our source mentions this mechanic stopped to help Lucas and Chinna even chat with them for a bit. Oh, really? And he said they seemed fine, happy, smiling, not freaking out like you might expect with a broken down van. He even remembers how excited Chino was about their trip. Wow. And this is before everything goes wrong, so in hindsight, it's just eerie. It's like the calm before the storm. And knowing what we know now, this encounter, it's not just some random detail. It tells us this wasn't some robbery gone wrong or a crime of opportunity. This, this was planned, thought out, and just the beginning of something much larger and much more sinister. Exactly, and it just keeps getting worse. A few days later, another body is discovered. Leonard Dick. And near him, a burnt-out truck. And guess whose names are connected to that truck? McLeod and Schmigelski. Bingo. And that's where this goes from a local tragedy to a national story. Yeah. We're not just talking about one crime scene anymore. It goes from British Columbia all the way to Manitoba. Huge distances. And a logistical nightmare for law enforcement. Trying to coordinate a search across basically, what is it, thousands of kilometers? Thousands. And not yeah. just open fields. We're talking about some of the most rugged and remote terrain in Canada. Right. It's not just about the distance. This whole case, it shines a light on so many different aspects of crime and investigation, stuff most people never even think about. It's true. This case really ran the gamut. Like, how do you even conduct a manhunt in a place that vast? And then there's the whole social media angle, how that plays into everything. Oh, absolutely. That was huge in this case. It's like a crash course in modern criminology, this whole thing. But hold on. Before we go too far down that road, we need to address something. Remember how the name Highway of Tears started popping up in the media early on? Yeah, I remember that. We have to talk about that. Because for those who don't know, the Highway of Tears, well... That represents a long and really tragic history of violence against Indigenous women in Canada. A really dark part of our history. And by even mentioning it alongside this case, there was this risk, you know, even if it wasn't intentional, of overshadowing those ongoing tragedies. That's a good point. It really makes you think about the responsibility of the media, especially in these big, sensitive cases. Huge responsibility. Okay, so McLeod and Schmigelski, they're officially on the run now. And they are not messing around. They covered a lot of ground in a short time. It's like an unbelievable amount. A burning RAV4 in Manitoba. Sightings in Saskatchewan. They even had that close call with, uh, was it band constables? Yeah, band constables. They had no idea who they'd stumbled upon at the time. Just goes to show. Crazy. It's easy to get caught up in the chase, you know. Think of it like an action movie. But we have to remember the real people involved. Their families, entire communities living in fear. And the pressure on the RCMP, they were working around the clock to find these guys before anyone else got hurt. Absolutely. And it wasn't just boots on the ground. They brought in everything, air support, canine units, even used thermal imaging. But like I was saying, trying to track two guys in that much wilderness, it's like trying to find a specific needle in a stack of needles. Yeah, you got to hand it to everyone involved in that search, though. The dedication, the hours they put in, the risk, especially out in those communities. Resources are already stretched thin, and then something like this happens. And they really stepped up, right? Yeah. Like in York Landing. That's where it gets really interesting. Remember we mentioned the Bear Clam Patrol? It was those volunteers who actually made the biggest break in the case. Can you believe that? No kidding. Yeah. Volunteer group. They're the ones who spotted two guys matching McLeod and Schmigulski's descriptions at that landfill. Talk about a roller coaster, right? right? One minute you think they've got nothing, the next they're this close to catching these guys. I know. And then just like that, poof, they're gone again. It's like a true crime documentary, you know? Helicopters, search parties everywhere, and it's this group of volunteers people trying to protect their own who almost end up making the difference. 
really says something about the power of community, especially when things go sideways. But you're right, all those emotions, the pressure, the fear, it takes a toll, not just on the investigators, but on everyone, you know? Yeah. The entire towns were on edge. Absolutely. And then all that energy, that hope, it just fizzles. The trail goes yeah. cold, the search winds down, and everyone's left wondering, did they actually get away with it? Did they disappear? Well, that's the thing. Our source is pretty clear on this point. It didn't end there. No. Not at all. This is where things get really interesting. Mm. I mean, this was 2019, right? The digital age in full swing. Mm -hmm. We've got to talk about social media. Oh, yeah. It was everywhere. Everybody was an expert. Everyone had a theory. Did all that online stuff help or hurt, do you think? I mean, it had to impact the investigation, right? Totally. It's one of those double-edged swords. Yeah. You've got this huge amount of public engagement, right? people comparing notes, sharing tips, pouring over maps, trying to figure out where these guys might go next. Yeah. That has to count for something. Right. But at the same time, you've got misinformation spreading faster than ever. Wild theories, people chasing ghosts, and worst of all, you've got these, I don't know what to call them, these trolls, basically cheering these guys on, celebrating the fact that they were on the run. It's creepy, right? Our source even mentions this one guy called himself Thomas Abramatoyo or something, claimed to be best buddies with McLeod and Schmigelski. Sickening. Makes you wonder, where's the line between being into true crime and, you know, being messed up. Absolutely. It's a slippery slope, that's for sure. Probably a whole other deep dive waiting to happen, thinking about the ethics of all this. Totally. Another conversation. But getting back on track, how does this whole digital circus end? Well, while everyone's busy playing detective online, it's actually a pretty low-tech discovery that changes everything. A blue sleeping bag. Tour guide found it near the Nelson River. And that's the one that leads them right to McLeod and Schmigelski's hideout. Crazy how these things happen. It's true, though. Almost unbelievable, right? Tiny detail missed by who knows how many people. And that's the thing that breaks the case wide open. It's wild. So that sleeping bag, the one that tour guide found, it wasn't just some random thing, right? It was like the clue that unraveled everything. Yeah, like the loose thread that unravels the whole sweater. The cops find this sleeping bag and then boom, they find a damaged rowboat nearby. Mm -hmm. Plus there's other stuff there, belongings, mm. and it doesn't take a genius to figure out who they belong to. McLeod and Schmigelski. Exactly. And then, well, it's the discovery everyone was expecting, but dreading. They found their bodies. They did. The manhunt was over. Just like that. What a weird feeling that must have been. Like, relief, obviously, but also, I don't know, sadness, disappointment even. Like, we're finally at the end of the story, but we still don't know why it happened. Absolutely, because finding them, it confirmed everything. It meant McLeod and Schmigelski were responsible for murdering Lucas Fowler, Chinadis, and Leonard Dyke. Mm -hmm. And to make matters worse, they found those confession videos the guys made before, you know. Before they took their own lives. Right. And those videos, I mean, talk about chilling. And they admit to everything, but there's just nothing. No explanation, no reason why. It's the lack of a why that gets to me. No remorse, no justification, just blankness. It's like they wanted to get caught, but we'll never know what drove them to do it in the first place. So what do we do with that? What's the takeaway from all of this? I mean, we've gone through the timeline, the manhunt, the social media frenzy, but it feels like we're right back where we started. A bunch of unanswered questions. I think that's the point sometimes. Life doesn't give us easy answers. Some things, some tragedies, they just defy explanation. We can look at the evidence, try to understand their psychology, but some mysteries just stay mysteries. And maybe that's okay. It's like you said earlier, it's about asking the questions, even if we don't like the answers or even if there aren't any. This whole thing, it makes you think, you know, about the stories we tell ourselves, about good and evil, about the darkness that can be hidden anywhere. It reminds us that real life isn't a movie. There's not always a neat ending, a satisfying resolution. The best we can do is learn from it all, keep those conversations going, and never stop questioning. I couldn't have said it better myself. And to everyone listening, we'll leave you with this. Imagine you're the detective on this case. Where do you even start? What details jump out at you? It's a real head scratcher. Something to think about, right? Until next time.